Welcome to this lecture about sensory information representation. My name is Jens Kremko and my lab is located at the Charité in Berlin. The central task of the brain is to integrate the outside information from the environment and to act upon it in an appropriate manner. And to do so, we have many senses. We have the sense of vision, smell, taste, touch, pain, etc. And in today's lecture, I will briefly explain you to key concepts about how this information from the sensory environment is represented at the level of the brain. And to introduce you to these key concepts, I will focus on the visual system. The visual system takes up a lot of, of a large part of the brain. It starts in the, in the eye, where the, the light is detected by photoreceptors and uh, in, the, in the retina, and where so-called retina ganglion cells feed this information um, to the visual thalamus, the LGN. The LGN is called lateral genucleate nucleus. From the thalamus, from the LGN, this information is then um, fed forward to the primary visual cortex, also called V1, which is at the back of your head. And within V1, there's already a lot of computation taking place, and we will look at it in this lecture a little bit. Um, but importantly, from visual cortex, this information is broadcasted and transmitted uh, along many different pathways, for example, the dorsal pathway and the ventral pathway, to so-called higher visual cortical areas that um, are important for complicated visual processing. But in today's lecture, and also to introduce you to the key concepts, I will mainly focus on the so-called early visual system, so the retina, the LGN, and V1. So now how do we find out how these neurons in these pathways represent sensory information? And there we can follow a systems approach. So basically we can treat the brain as a, as a black box and that we want to study. And a very common way of, of approaching this um, question is to provide a set of inputs, then measuring the set of outputs that these inputs produce, and by, by doing that in a systematic manner, we can slowly but steadily understand what the system is, is implementing and what the mechanisms are. And the visual system, the input is, is straightforward, is a, the visual stimulus, uh, visual stimulus which we can represent or show on a, on a regular um, computer screen. And the output is then the neural activity that we measure at the different places in the, uh, in the early visual system. For example, the V1 or the LGN or retina. And by then systematically testing different stimuli, for example, this bar or a bar in a different orientation, we can infer what the neurons the, the mechanisms of how these neurons represent the sensing information. And in the next few slides, I will give you a, a brief introduction to two three key concepts that we have discovered over the last decades. A very important concept in sensory um, systems is the term receptive field. A receptive field is basically the area in the sensory environment that the neuron is selected for. For example, imagine you record a neuron up here in V1, then this neuron does not just respond to all places in the visual field. No, it only responds to a small localized area in, in, in the visual field. And this is it's called receptive field. This is here shown for vision, but the same applies to, for example, the somatic sensory system. So that's a very important concept. Another key important concept is that the, the visual world is mapped in a topographic manner onto the visual cortex. What does that mean is that means is that a neuron that is next to it in, in V1, so for example the green neuron here relative to the yellow one, also has a receptive field that is not far from, from uh, the, the receptive field of the other neuron. So they, the, the neighborhood relationship is, is maintained. To illustrate that further, the blue neuron here on the right will have yet a different uh, receptive field in a different location. Important, the, the visual field is mapped in a topographic manner onto the visual cortex. And this is called a retinotopic map. And again, this you also find in, for example, the somatic sensory system. But how do we now find out about the receptive fields? How can we measure this? What are, what are the techniques? How did, we, how did we come up about it? And here we employed, or we can use a, a relatively straightforward analysis method, which is called spike-triggered averaging. And as the name already implied, it simply is taking the visual stimulus, for example, in our case, uh, the, visual, um, the visual stimulus, so the, these, for example, the random checkable patterns 
and average those uh, in relation to the spike time. So for example, this is the spike times are our, our output. And um, we, if we want to know what drives these new into spike, we simply average the, the, the stimuli that preceded the spike. And for one spike, we don't see much. But if we do that multiple, across multiple spikes, we can see on average what this new is selected for. This is shown here on the right, where basically here we have a num number of different spikes. And then over time, on average, we can see its receptive field. So this is the visual stimulus. And on average, this neuron, this example neuron here, um, responds to that localized part in the visual field. And this, is, this approach is very common in, 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 in visual neuroscience. And just to illustrate this a bit further, I made a little animation for you. So what you see here, or what you will see here, is a, is an, is a spike target average example that is done on in real data, on in vivo data. And on the left, you see the current frame that was happening around the time of the spike. And on the right, you see the spike target average. And here, the number of spikes that were included. And it starts with just one spike. And you see that we just basically copied this frame onto the, onto the average, and we don't see much. But you will see, once I start the animation, and this average includes more and more spikes, you see the structure. Let me just start this. You see here, so this is the number of spikes. And slowly but slowly, but steadily, you, you see that the, the average emerges and the receptive field becomes evident. And this is because, uh, very likely, this nuance, when there was a stimulus in this location, it spiked very often, or with a high probability, and the, the noise is, is averaged out. So this is how we can do, how we can measure the receptive fields. And this is the receptive field of one neuron. And just to illustrate the retinotopic map, I plot here the receptive fields of three simultaneously recorded neurons. And you see that the neuron 1 has a receptive field on the left, neuron 2 in the center, and neuron 3 on the right. This is just to illustrate the, the concept of retinotopic map. Importantly, the retinotopic map is not uniform. What does it mean? It means that our vision is not that not like a camera where we just scan the visual field with with the same density of um, you know, photoreceptors or with, um, pixels, but instead our visual system um, has a high security in the center of its of, of the fixation in the fovea. This is shown here on the left where you see the visual field, and this is the center of the fovea. It's very tiny. You know, this is supposed to show the first 16 degree visual degree. And it turns out that this tiny part here is represented at the cortical level um, and of a high, higher magnification. And this is shown here on the, on the right side, where you see the, the visual cortex kind of seen from the top. And you see the retinotopic map, the visual field projected onto it. And you see here on the left, on the right, the fovea. And you see that the first 16 degrees, so this tiny spot in the visual field, kind of take up almost half of the visual cortex. And I'm showing this here to emphasize that the, the representation on the cortical level of the sense information is really tailored to the specific needs of the system. So in our case, we have high spatial acuity at the center, and therefore a lot of cortical network is uh, devoted to analyzing this, this small part of the visual field. In addition, so I showed you this, these receptive fields, in addition, to just being localized, these receptive fields have a lot of, they're dynamic and they have a lot of interesting properties. And a key concept here is the so-called center in surround. So the center of a receptive field is, is really the part where visual stimulus drive um, the neuron to a spike. And the surround is has a more modulatory um, function. So when you present stimuli in the surround, you don't really drive spiking in this, in, of the neuron, but you can modulate it. And this is very nicely illustrated in, in the, in the so-called on-center and off-surround cells in the retina and LGN, and likewise the off-center and on-surround cells in the retina and LGN. So what is on and off? On and off are two major pathways in the visual system. So the on pathway is there to process light increments, so everything that's brighter than the, the average, and the off pathways is there to process a light decrements, so darks. And the, the receptive fields are shown here, so the on-center cell Response to white spots to a small white spot and um, surrounded by a dark, so the off surround. And 
often these cells I have an so-called um, the, the center is excitatory and the surround is suppressive, shown here by the minus signs. And what that means is that if you present a light spot over the center, the neuron starts to spike a lot. This is shown here by these ticks, so this is supposed to be time, these are action potentials, this is the visual stimulus. When you present a small spot, this neuron spikes um, quite with a high firing rate. If you now extend this, um, this white disk to the suppressive of surround, then this firing rate decreases. And if you even um, present a light annulus with a dark center, then you can really suppress the firing of this on-center cell. With the off-center cell, it's the same thing, just inverted. Now a dark spot really strongly excites them, and a light spot suppresses them. So these on-center and off-center, uh, on-center of surround cells you find in the retina and the LGN, and they're kind of spot detectors. This is a cartoon, just to show you how these look in vivo. I present here on the right a receptive field measured in vivo. And now color code is red on and blue is off. And you can see the non-center cell is a you know, small receptive field with a faint surround. And then off the center, the, the, other, the other way around. And these are classic examples of LGN neuron receptive fields. And they're often modeled as so-called difference of Gaussian where the on-center is modeled as a, as a small Gauss, so this is the excitatory part of the receptive field. And the suppressive field is modeled as a, as a Gauss with a wider sigma. All right, this already shows that receptive fields are dynamic and they are their interactions. And why the LGN and the retina have more of these kind of spot detector receptive fields, neurons at the higher level of the visual hierarchy have often more complicated response features. And a very important response feature in this context is the so-called orientation selectivity. Because it turns out that when you look in the, the visual environment, that it is comprised a lot about, uh, from it contains a lot of oriented edges. For example, if we take this Neuromatch Academy logo here, then imagine you your receptive field book look here at the left, then it would kind of cover a vertical black white edge. If your receptive field would look on the top here, it would cover a horizontal edge. Yet, if it would look at the Y over here, it would be an oblique edge. And this is an ubiquitous um, aspect of, of natural visual stimuli. And it turns out that neurons in the visual cortex are very selective to the orientation of an edge. And this is called orientation selectivity and it was first discovered in cortical neurons. It was discovered by recording neural activity in the visual cortex. And it was discovered by um, Hubel and Wiesel in the 50s. And they received a Nobel Prize for that discovery because it's an essential aspect of visual processing and the way visual sensory information is represented at the cortical level. So what this original figure shows here is on the left, the visual stimulus with horizontal and vertical bars and oblique bars. And on the right, the neural activity that these um, bars evoked. And you see that this particular neuron preferred a vertical bar, shown here with our strong responses. And the, the black line here is the visual stimulus. And these um, um, responses here are, or, or these, these responses are often characterized by so called tuning curves. So basically, a tuning curve is, is, a, is, a, is a, the firing rate as a function of the stimulus feature that you test. For example, in this example, it's the orientation of the of the bar. And often these these neurons in cortex they have a so-called this bell-shaped orientation uh, the tuning curve. With a preferred orientation, for example, in this case uh, with a vertical bar, and then falling off at the flanks um, when the stimulus has uh, is going away from, from the preferred orientation. Interesting about these tuning curves, and you will see them a lot in in, in in sensory neuroscience is that these they're nice to characterize the selectivity. So a very narrow tuning curve represents a very selective neuron. A very broad tuning curve represents a more you know unselective neuron. And the, 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 this is really a key concept, the tuning curve, and you find them across many different sensory systems and across different stimulus parameters. So here it's the orientation preference. But you will also find tuning curves for the motion direction. So the direction of motion of the visual stimulus 
is a very important aspect for, for neurons in the visual system. I'm showing you one example that is highly motion direction selective. So what you see here on the left is a color map with the responses. So on X is the, the time and on Y the direction of motion of the, of the moving bar. And then it color codes the response strength. So when you see that this particular neuron st strongly responded to a kind of downward left motion uh, moving bar. And this is then often represented in the so-called polar plot representation, where uh, the maximum firing rate, for example, is plotted as a function of the, of the angle of the motion direction. And you see that this particular neuron prefers the uh, left downwards um, moving bar. Yet another example are so-called spatial frequency tuning curves in, of visual neurons, where we, these are tested by, so by moving gratings, and the grating can have a, a different spatial frequency, so it can be a high spatial frequency neuron uh, grating or a low spatial frequency grating, and depending on the spatial frequency, these neurons show this kind of tuning with a preferred spatial frequency. So these are two examples of, of tunings, there are other tunings, and in neurons or in the visual system and yet other different tunings, for example, in the auditory system. But it's important, these, these tuning curves are important concepts for discussing how sensory information is represented at the level of the brain. Another key aspect um, to this question is that these neurons that have a certain response selectivity are not just randomly organized in visual cortex. The, for example, neuron preferring a horizontal or a vertical bar, they're not just randomly intermingled in the cortical network, but they, they form a so-called functional map. And this I'm showing here on this slide, where um, this image here is, is a top-down view on, on visual cortex, and the color encodes the preferred orientation at that given location. For example, the yellow region would be neurons that are responsive to vertical bars, in the dark blue region, the neurons responding to horizontal bars. And what you can see there is a beautiful um, so-called orientation preference map, where on the preferred orientation changes systematically across the cortical surface. And it's um, you can see these stars here, these are so-called pinwheels, where the it's a discontinuity where the preferred orientation changes rapidly. And this has been a phenomenon. It has been quite studied a lot, and as I'm showing you to represent this as a representative example for, um, for functional organization of sensory cortices. Another important aspect is that these, um, that these functional maps are often related. For example, um, at the same place here where we see the orientation preference map, we also have a, a retinotopic map. And people have studied the relationship between these um, ways of sensory representations. And the key um, link there is the, the link of the retinotopy to the preferred orientation. And this is shown here on the, on, the, on the single cell level, where I show a receptive field of an in vivo neuron measured with um, light spots, so the on response is shown in red, or a dark spot shown in blue here. When you overlay these um, on and off responses, so the responses to lights and darks, you see that the receptive field has a almost looks like an edge, like a dark light edge. So this is the light part, this is the dark part. So it's kind of an edge detector. And remarkably, the orientation of this edge and the spatial frequency matches fairly well the tuning of that neuron when measured with moving bars. So this is shown here on the right, where you see the polar representation of the tuning curve with the magenta is the prediction of the receptive field map. So these so-called simple cells in visual cortex, they kind of are edge detectors. Uh, established by these on-off um, and the light-dark receptive field aspects. And they're often modeled as so-called GABA filters. And this is also a concept that you will hear a lot about the, when discussing the visual system. So these re simple cell receptive fields are modeled as GABA filters, which are a sine wave, a sinusoidal wave, multiplied with a Gaussian curl. So it's a localized sine wave. And the nice thing about these GABA filters is that they, they, they have an orientation, as shown here. They have an on-off receptive field, so they have a spatial phase. And so they are kind of localized oriented edge detectors. And they are very important in the field of computation 
and also computer vision. So I'm, I'm showing this here to illustrate there's a strong link between the retinotopy and the, 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 the tuning of um, to the moving bars on a single cell level, but even on the population level, the, there is a link. And just to briefly illustrate this, I'm showing you some slides from, from my from my work as a postdoc, where we measured uh, the the function organization of, a, of the visual cortex along the horizontal dimension by recording with multi electrode arrays in vivo in the visual cortex. And we discovered that, that the, the, the way the on and off retinotopy, so these receptive field locations, are mapped onto the cortical surface, that these are the origin of the orientation map. And this is shown here in this figure, where you see a series of recording sites simultaneously recorded across the horizontal dimension of cortex. Here you see the receptive fields that are just introduced with the on and the off in red and blue. And here the, the tuning of these neurons to moving bars. And you see that the prediction that these, that these so-called edge detector receptive fields um, make in terms of the tuning preference are well matched across the entire recording length here. And that means that the, the way the on and off retinotopy is mapped is the origin of this functional organization. And this, I'm just showing you this here to, to really stress and emphasize that the, the functional organization, the way sensory information is represented at the cortical level, is very structured and highly organized. And there are a lot of links between these different um, levels of representations. All right, so this was about simple cells and GABA functions or at edges. It, there are many more complicated ways of how sensory information is represented. For example, I just showed you the simple cells, but there are also concepts called complex cells, which are cells in the visual cortex that, um, that are response to lights and darks, irrespective of the spatial phase, so whether there's the, the on or off is left or right, that doesn't matter for these cells. They're called complex, and they're also tuned, and there are ideas and models of how they are generated. And even though they are called complex, they are still very simple, because when we look at the, the visual system then as a, as a going away from, from visual cortex, it's evident that the representation becomes more and more complicated. This is just shown here in this figure where this image here is first the lower level processing of the early visual system decomposed in, in orientation, in color, in contrast, in disparity, in motion direction, etc. And then the further we go in the visual hierarchy, we find intermediate level processings like shape discrimination, texture discrimination, etc. Then eventually, at one point, we go to higher level processing where we have object recognition. So finally, we can recognize the code here in this image. So you see that the visual system first decomposes the, uh, the visual scene into various levels of um, representations, and then from that builds more complicated representations. What all these have in common is that often these, these level of representation are not just randomly intermixed, but they are they're organized in functional maps. So I showed you the map for orientation and retinotopy, but it turns out that there are many more functional maps in visual cortex. This is just a little cartoon here to illustrate this. So here you see the orientation preference map that I just talked about, but then there's another map for the eye dominance. So we have two eyes, the, the right and the left. Again, that is another functional map in visual cortex. We can have so-called color blobs, blobs where there are regions in these maps that are that contain neurons that are selective to, to color, etc. And I'm really just showing this here to emphasize that this the way sensory information is represented at the level of visual cortex is highly structured. And understanding the structure and the mechanism and the origin of this structure is, a, is an important aspect of visual neuroscience and an important aspect of learning the mechanisms of how the brain makes sense out of the outside world. With this, I would like to come to the summary. I, in this brief lecture, I introduced you to key concepts such as receptive fields and tuning curves. Just a little recap, I showed you the on, center, and off surround receptive fields um, as, a, as an example of how that these receptive fields are dynamic and that they are interacting. And I would like to refer you to you to the video spike spiking activity video as well, where they also discuss this concept of centers around and receptive fields. Then I introduce you to the concept of tuning curves, where we study the neural activity dependence on the stimulus 
a feature, for example, orientation preference, and I introduce you to this bell shape response um, curves, or another example, the spatial frequency tuning curve. Again, these concept of tuning curves is, is very important for when we're discussing the sensory information representation in the brain. And at last, I showed you one example where we can link um, the, the level of the representation, for example, the level of retinotopy, to the level of the orientation preference tuning. And this is one example. There are other examples where there's a clear link between these level of representations. All right, this, with this I'm done. I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have further questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you.